Welcome back, friends and listeners, to your favorite true crime podcast, Truth, Lies, and Alibis, by two 911 dispatchers. Episode 19, Lauren's Promise. This week, Brittany and I discuss the heartbreaking tragedy of Lauren McCluskey. We'll talk about her struggles, the man that killed her, and the police department that let her down. Jess, do you have a fun fact for us today? I sure do. (laughs) I'm here to teach you things and not make you sad. That's your job. (laughs) That's sad. (laughs) Did you know that apples, peaches, and raspberries are all members of the Rose family? Says who? Website. Please don't ask me questions. (laughs) I didn't research this like you researched the articles. I pull I pull up true facts. I specifically Google facts that are true. I don't fact check them. <laughs> I'm talking out my ass. <laughs> okay, so it's whatever Google says is true. It's what Parade.com <laughs> says. Okay, keep going. Can you believe it? 105 weird facts that'll blow your mind. Did I research about apples, peaches, and raspberries being roses? No, it's fact number five. <laughs> okay. How? I didn't I, I'm asking. I just, I need more. I need you to tell me why. Why what? But why? I I need to know why on every single thing in my life, Jessica. I need to know. But I'm confused as <laughs> but how why, why are they applies in... to the fact? Because <laughs> why are they part of the rose? It has to do with the DNA that makes them up. The whole genus species thing. Okay, I'll take it. Whatever you say. I'm not talking about like Mr. and Mrs. Rose and their three (laughs) children, apples, peaches, and raspberries. (laughs) I thought you were going to make a Schitt's Creek joke right there, but you missed that opportunity. I don't, I don't want, I've never watched it. (laughs) I've been told that I would like it, but I hardly take in new content. So, okay, I won't give you any advice on what to watch then. No, you shit on my fact. <laughs> I just needed to know why. My very true fact. I thought it was going to say something like how tomatoes are fruits because they have seeds. seeds in them or whatever. Yeah. That's what I was asking. Mm, nope. I d- my brain just wants to know why. There needs to be an explanation for everything. It's a problem I have, okay? You want to hear a story? You want to. <laughs> You want some sadness yeah. in your life now? I mean, yeah. We'll, we'll get away from Do you like that segue? It was smooth. Uh, anyway. <laughs> now that I feel personally attacked after I personally attacked you. I have one job on this ship. <laughs> All right. No more fooling around. It's time to get sad. <laughs> No more fooling around. It's time to be depressed and to hate everybody and to trust nobody. So I'm going to tell you the story about Lauren McCluskey. Have you heard of her? Nope. Okay. Lauren McCluskey was a University of Utah athlete. She was always active and liked track, dancing, surfing, and other activities. In 2008, she got second place in the high jump in the U.S. Junior Olympics, which is pretty cool. That's cool. Her friends described her as smart, outgoing, and dependable. She was described as super smart, super intense, and dedicated to her family by one friend. September 1st, 2018, Lauren was in her senior year when she met a bouncer at a bar. He said his name was Sean and that he was 28 and went to the local community college. He also told her that he worked at a local call center. He asked for her number and the two began to date. According to her friends, the relationship was very fast moving and intense almost from the start. Her friends say that he seemed kind of controlling and that Lauren kind of seemed anxious around him, which is never a good sign. No. He would call her and he would be super angry and he would ask where she was, who she was with, what she was doing, like all the time, constantly. And her friends say he got her pepper spray to protect herself from other men. That's a quote. He also took her shooting and told her he wanted to buy her a gun. And I guess guns aren't allowed on campus, obviously, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So one of her friends told their, what is it called, an RA? Yeah. Yeah. And then they kind of talked to her about it. And in October of 2018, mind you, this is a month. September 1st, she meets him, right? Mm -hmm. October of 2018, Lauren went home to Pullman, Washington during the break to visit her parents. While home, she decides to do some research on her new boyfriend because she had found an ID with his picture that had said his name was Melvin Sean Rowland. She finds information on the web that Sean was actually a sex offender who was 37 and he had pled. Wow. Yeah. And he had pled guilty to two sex crimes 14 years earlier. 
She talked to her mom about breaking up with him. However, Roland had her car while she was gone, and she needed to get it back. The night she got back to the dorm, he came over and spent the night. He denied that anything inappropriate had ever happened, and he told her that the girl had lied about her age and made up false allegations against him. Which I'm like, uh-huh, that's what they always say. One. Two. You lied about your age. I'm confused as to why... <laughs> I don't want this to turn around to blame her at all, right? But Mm -hmm. you find that out and like, why does there need to be a conversation about breaking up with him? Why isn't it like, oh shit, I gotta break up with this guy. (laughs) I think she was kind of afraid of him. I mean, it sounds like it's a month, right? And he's already super controlling and domestic violence is obviously a thing, even if it's not physical yet. Yeah. I also think maybe she wanted to believe him because she loved him. I don't know. It's weird. Also, I agree with you. Why does there need to be a conversation? Just be like, peace out. Also, not even the criminal history, right? Like finding out somebody is 10 years older than how old they said they were. Like the age age isn't always something to get caught up on. But if you're going to lie that you're 10 years younger, that's that's weird. (laughs) It's super weird. Yeah, you know. age difference. A, what, whoever, you know, as long as they're legal. legal. Yeah. Adults. <laughs> consenting adults. Exactly. Yeah. Just don't lie about it. <laughs> if she liked the guy enough to date him at 28, then she probably would have not cared that he was 38. Exactly. You know? She stayed with him through all the other stuff. Yeah. And anyway. anyway. <laughs> However, the information I found states that he had pled guilty to attempting to sexually assault a teenage girl. He also admitted to raping two other women as well as another teenage girl and had threatened in 2016 to become violent if he was ever contacted by law enforcement in the field. On October 10th, 2018, Lauren's mom, Jill, placed a call to the University of Utah Police. She asked for a civil standby for Lauren so she could pick up her vehicle And the dispatcher then calls Lauren to see if she felt comfortable getting her vehicle or if she wanted campus security to escort her. Lauren asks for an escort. At 1700, Lauren calls them to let them know that her vehicle has been dropped off at the parking lot of the school stadium. Security picked Lauren up and drove her to get her vehicle. So it sounds like she was trying to do the right thing and stay safe. Yeah, be safe. Yeah. Yeah. Just two days later, on October 12th, Lauren called the university police again to tell them that she'd received messages from someone she believed to be Roland. The texts state that Roland was actually dead and it was Lauren's fault because she had broken up with him. Through social media posts, however, she determined that wasn't true. I'm like, if you're gonna pretend to be dead, don't post on Facebook, dumbass. Who supposedly sent this uh, this message? His friends. But it was him. Like from his phone or? No, it was, it sounds like, from what I read, it sounds like he probably used apps to get different phone numbers or, Uh, you know, mm. maybe he had burner phones, who knows. So the officer assigned to the call asked if she felt like she was in danger or if any of the texts were threatening. She told him that she did not, but she was suspicious that whoever it was might be trying to get her to meet them for a suspicious reason. Mm. The officer advised her that she should not go anywhere she felt she might be in danger and to call back if she received any more suspicious texts or calls. The next day at 922, Lauren calls the university police to tell them about an additional message she had received from the friends demanding money. The person texting her wanted $1,000 or they would post some compromising pictures of her online. She talks to Officer Miguel Darris, I think is how you say it, and a report was taken this time and the detective was assigned to look into the possible extortion charges. I, I'm going to send I've you her call. blackmailed um, for for money with threats of sending out me. Okay. Do you live in Salt Lake or Sandy or? Salt Lake City. Or are you up on campus? I'm up on campus, okay. but it's, I guess the... So you live on like campus? One... Let me go ahead and get you over. University of Police will probably take the case then, just one sec. I've, I've talked to them already, but okay. I just wanted to call you as well. Um. Because usually, if you've already reported it, usually we just take it where you live. And then that agency does a case because, like, if they make threats, the most likely they'll come is at your house or place. So you normally don't have to make multiple okay. reports. Did they tell you to call us? Or did they take a case and give you a case number? No, they didn't. Okay. But you already did talk to them and tell them about it? or? Yeah, I was just concerned because I wasn't sure how long they were going to take to are you in line for an officer file to call arrest. you? Oh, file arrest. But they didn't give you a case number at all? Oh, I think they did. Hold on. Okay. Um, Do you want to talk to them and see 
kind of more about what's going on with your case? I'm sorry, what was that? Do you want to talk to them to see what's going on with your case? Yes, there's a case number. Okay, let me get you up to them if they can see what's going on with it. Just one moment. Okay. Thanks. I'll talk to them. First. University 911, what is your emergency? Hey, it's City. She's got a case number pending, um, but she's receiving additional blackmail threats. It's been up from her so far, but she does have a case number. She's on the line. Okay. Okay, they transferred her over, but did you hear how she sounded, like, scared a little? Like, she didn't know what she was doing, kind of, and she was concerned because she hadn't heard anything? I mean, yeah, I feel like that's pretty common to yeah. hear on the phone in a situation like that. I wouldn't say that it sounded, like, if I was taking that call, it wouldn't sound any different than other calls like that I've taken. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was thinking was, like, the same thing we would be like, well, it's their call, we're going to transfer you. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the truth of it, right? Like, that dispatcher says it goes to the agency where you live. Mm -hmm. So it very much lines up with how our center worked, right? Because we do live somewhere with a university campus where... If the victim is on campus and that's where the crime is occurring, then campus police pulls the report and we might get an ATL or officer information or something like that. Like since the guy's not a student, we might get like an ATL for his vehicle or something like that. Keep an eye out for this guy. But there's not going to be an additional report pulled by the yeah. city unless something happens in the city. So, like, if they're at Walmart and there's a DV or, you know, an assault or something like that, that's when city will take the report. But for a situation like this, it's it would be campus police. Yeah. yeah. And that's kind of what I, like, what I wanted to bring to light because I think sometimes yeah. not everybody understands that. Like, even I was mm -hmm. working a the hospital and there was a case of some sort that involved law enforcement and they were wondering why our county couldn't do anything about what had happened and I had to explain like well it occurred in this county so that county actually has to pre like they have to file the charges they have to tell us you have probable cause to arrest can you arrest them and hold us like there has there's steps that have to be followed and i think sometimes the public doesn't quite understand that yeah it's that word that's thrown around on all of your procedural cop dramas and stuff like that jurisdiction yeah like that's not just a word that cops argue over <laughs> That's a very real thing. So even considering city versus county, which like it's a whole chain of things, right? Your campus is in your city and your city is in your county. But just because it's on campus doesn't mean county is going to take it. it yeah. It's the smallest map, right? Instead of going larger, it's smaller. And honestly, in my opinion, you'd hope that when you pull the report, somebody's going to do their best effort to take care of it and do their job. Yeah. In my mind, given my experience and just kind of how my, my thought process works on it too, I wouldn't want to have multiple reports with multiple agencies mm -hmm. because things are going to get confusing. You're going to have, I don't know, that, se that seems like a very easy way to actually miss something. Yeah. And because it is a campus within a city within a county, if they need assistance, if campus police need to go contact the guy, they'll reach out to city. Yeah. And city will go and do a agency assist. So it's not like just because the guy lives off campus that nothing's going to happen. Yeah. That's not true. It's just that ugly word of jurisdiction where... Well, I was going to say too is like, it's not like the TV shows where they're fighting over who gets to take it oftentimes. It's more like, it's yours. <laughs> Like, it's your, yeah, it's yours because it's here. I'm just <laughs> saying from my experience, that's yeah. how it is. So anyway, she basically transfers the call over to the university and the university talks to her and all this stuff. And then it's later determined. Do you remember Miguel Darez, the officer who she had spoken mm -hmm. to previously, had actually shared the images that Lauren had sent of the pictures being threatened to be posted with other officers that he had them on his personal phone and bragged oh about being able to see them whenever he wanted. So that's not... Great, it's great, not, great, great. Cool, 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 cool. I wish awesome. you guys could see Jessica's face right now. She was rubbing her eyes so furiously. I had a mini meltdown for a moment. Yeah, it's... I just, I just get so mad. It's awful. It's And that's why, like, I was like, I'm going to include this. Like, they don't determine this till much later, but... 
I wanted to point out that this girl, she's so frustrated because she hasn't heard anything because they don't have time to keep her updated or whatever. And yet he has time to be like, look at these nudes this girl showed me. This victim showed me as part of a case. Six days later, on October 19th, the investigation begins when a detective calls Lauren to get more information on the event and to identify anyone who might be involved. Six days after she makes the initial report. So some of the stuff I read said that the detective was leaving for the day or I don't know, but it, there was a delay in getting a detective on the case, basically. Is it bad that I think six days <laughs> is it that long to get in contact with a detective? No. <laughs> I mean, speaking as someone who's filed a report for something and still hasn't heard and it's been a month later, I'm just saying. But... It doesn't make it acceptable. Yeah. Because it happens doesn't mean it's okay. <laughs> exactly. And she's called multiple times. So, like, the least you could do is just call her and be like... Hey, we have the information. We're working on it. It's been assigned to Detective So and So. Yeah, like Give her a name. she just wants to know that someone's actually doing Somebody's something. Doing and the something. thing I think that I wanted to point out here is that, like, oftentimes we get those angry callers who haven't heard, and they just want someone to listen to them. They just want to yeah. be heard. They just want to be told, "I hear you. I'm sorry for your frustration." They want to feel like they're being taken seriously, right? Like yeah. in a situation like this, where this girl is scared and like she's being blackmailed and she hasn't heard anything. Like, well, and he's tried to get her to meet him, and he said that he was dead, and it's just bad vibes all around. Right. After not hearing from the campus police, that phone call you heard, Lauren actually calls Salt Lake Police Department to ask for help. And the dispatcher explains that it's not their jurisdiction. She'll have to speak to campus police. Later, through security camera footage, it is found that Roland was at various locations on campus October 19th through October 22nd. So he's just kind of roaming around campus and they find video footage of this later. On October 22nd at 1039, Lauren emailed about yet another questionable message she had received claiming to be Deputy Chief Rick McLennan requesting she come to the police station. It was later determined that this text was from Roland and he was trying to get Lauren to leave her dorm. My question is, why didn't they at least send someone just through the area for suspicious activity? Like, you know, it is a little bit weird that he's pretending to be this person or go so check on her. did she report that at the time? She emailed the detective. My advice, that's not the best way to get a hold of your detective. No. For anybody out there working with a detective, if you want something to happen immediately, don't email them. No, call <laughs> and talk to dispatch. From 3 to 6 p.m., he spends time waiting on campus with some of her friends at Residence Hall. And at 2020, Lauren is on the phone with her mother when Roland confronts her outside of her residence hall. She's heard dropping her cell phone and belongings. Roland had abducted her, dragged her to a car he had driven on campus, forced her in the vehicle, and then shot her multiple times. Jeez. At 2023, a call comes into dispatch from Lauren's father. He tells the dispatcher that his daughter was in trouble and okay, that his wife Okay, you're on the phone with the abducted. dispatch for the University of Utah. Hi, this is my Hi, this is Chris with the University of Utah Police. Hi, my daughter, Lauren McCluskey, uh, was talking to her mom, and then she just started saying, no, 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 and it sounded like someone might have been grabbing her or something. Okay. How long ago was this? This was just two, uh, two minutes ago. Okay. Carol, can you come down here? Does she live on campus? Yeah. Okay. Listen. Okay, and what what's her name? Lauren McCluskey. Okay, will you spell that last name for me? I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Will you, will you spell the last name for me? Yes. Okay. Okay, and what's her date of birth? Okay. And you said the phone line went dead. Yeah, the phone line went dead. Okay. Have you tried calling her back? No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the phone is not dead, but but we can't, um, her, she must have dropped it and the phone connection is still here. It's, do you want the number or? Uh, yes, please, open. It's, oh, what? Okay, and do you happen to know what building or room number she lives in? I'm sorry? Do you know what room number she lives in and what building? Uh, yes, but, well, um, what building she her, her house. Okay, just, just concentrate. Okay. So it's building. Okay, 
She was she was walking from G C fifteen seventy. Okay. To her car. Uh, to her car. All right. And what was your name? My name is Matt McCluskey. Okay. Okay, what's good phone number for you? All right. She Perfect. had broken up with a boy okay. or a man um, recently, and um, he's a pretty tall black guy. Sean Fields is his name. Okay. Has he made any threats or anything like that? His friends were kind of harassing her a little bit. Well, they were. The campus police were involved with that. Yes. Okay, I actually, I have an officer right here that dealt with that. Let me talk to him for one second. I'll be right back on with you, okay? I'll still be able to hear you, but you won't be able to hear me. I know. We have to concentrate on helping. So the officer there who knows about his, her situation, he's telling us to this. Yeah, keep it on. Okay, you get the gist of that. Yeah. While on the phone, someone had found Lauren's phone and picked it up and told her mother that she found her belongings in the parking lot next to her dorm. So they relay that information. Any comments on the call? Yeah, let me let me cut in and make some comments on the call. So does dad know the severity of which... I mean, he obviously knows that threats were made and a report was taken, right? Yeah, I think that he also... Maybe they didn't know the extent of it, it sounds like. And... I'm pretty sure they gave his name that he had given her the first time. So I don't think they had his real name. I just, I mean, obviously that it's a moment of panic, even though he is staying really calm, right? They don't yeah. know what's going on with their daughter. But why is that not the second thing you say? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's just kind of in shock and he was trying to, I think it sounded like he was worried about his wife and he was trying to like. Oh yeah. Keep her calm. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like that would be. Again, I, I'm, I'm not trying to put any blame on him, right? No. Like this just observations from the call is that it, it, that's a critical piece of information that the dispatcher needs to know. Like we possibly know what's going on. Like she's been yeah. having issues with this guy who, you know, there's this history with. Yeah, that's the thing is my advice to 911 callers or callers like that. Get straight to the point. Don't like just be like, hey, this happened. We think it's this person. Yeah, especially in a situation like this, yeah. right, where there's background to it. Please don't start off with five years ago this yeah, happened, but no. <laughs> if it's pertinent, say, you know, my wife was on the phone with the daughter, something happened, it sounded like somebody grabbed her or something like that. She's been going through this ordeal with her ex. Yes. Like, that's so important so to know. So we can get that information out as soon as possible. Especially, like, it takes the priority up from being an ambiguous kind of unknown what's going on to something that feels very critical. Yeah. And it's not that it it's going to be less critical if we don't know that. It kind of just lights a fire under people's asses. Yeah. I and I mean it thankfully there was an officer nearby that was familiar with the situation. Like yeah. also I they they beat around the bush about where she lived without them narrowing down like I know people don't like it when we talk about what the dispatcher could have done better, but I'm going to do hey, it. This so. is an opinion podcast for legal reasons. We've said before, <sighs> this is an opinion podcast. Go ahead. Is that there was no question of there was question of where she lived on campus, but not like, do you know where she was when this happened? Yeah. From my experience, campuses aren't small. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Though, just that they may have she, said she was by her dorm, but that still doesn't. That's so amb. Yeah, yeah, that doesn't by her dorm. Like, even if they don't know, ask. Yeah, you don't know if they know if you don't ask. Where exactly so, okay, was she? Like, yeah, do you know where she was when this happened? Yeah, and then you get by her dorm. Okay, that's fine, but don't assume like. And that's, I guess, another thing uh, as a point for dispatchers: don't assume they don't know the answer i've done that before like that's yeah. a mistake where i just didn't ask because i was like oh well they don't know that so they probably don't know this yeah just ask just ask because then you know that they don't know agreed and don't assume that you know the answer either that's another thing to think no, of. just don't assume yeah 
But those those were my big two things about the call is pl- please bring up very pertinent information pretty quickly mm-hmm. and also find out where she was. <laughs> and as the dispatcher, maybe ask, like, because eventually you got to, oh, was she being threatened or anything? Like, maybe is there a reason that do you think that she was kidnapped? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Something like that. But I will say that her dad did a pretty good job at being calm, even yeah. though he didn't get straight to the point. I think he was probably freaking out inside. Oh, yeah. But you could hear the mom in the background freaking out. And dad was like, because, you know, sometimes we get those callers who are Stay so calm. overly like, oh, my God, this happened. Ah! And it's like so hard. You're like, I need you to repeat that. I need you to tell me exactly what yeah. happened. So I thought yeah. I thought he did a good job. I don't know. I just wanted to point that out because sometimes yeah. I feel like calm is better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's true, right? Like just because I said that I would have offered information sooner doesn't mean I am saying he did a bad job. Oh, no, no, I no. Think that's he... not what I was saying. I just was saying yeah. he did a great no, job. for the listeners out there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't want to come off in, as the villain. Jess, I admitted that... I was the worst 911 caller of all time already, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to take your 911 call. Not if it <laughs> is related to my children. No. Could you imagine for a second you call 911 and you get me? <laughs> no, I don't have to worry about what you think of me. I'd be like, Brittany, I need you to give down. me this information. <laughs> Calm down. Yeah. That, but out of that whole, out of that whole thing, those are my only two things. Yeah, I think you're you're gonna get madder. But here we go. Through these calls, police are able to respond to the parking lot and begin searching her dorm, the surrounding areas, and the parking lot area itself. So, like, where the person found her stuff? Yes. Police don't find Roland on campus as he has already picked up and on his way to a date with another woman he had met on the Wow! Are you kidding me? Nope, no joke. Sorry I'm a little late and my shoes are dirty. I just killed my ex. I just had to get some closure in that before I could really move on. Yeah, what an asshole, right? At 21.55, an hour and a half after Lauren's dad had called, her body is discovered in the vehicle that is still parked in the parking lot, and an alert is then sent out to campus that there had been a shooting and everyone should stay where they are. I don't know it. I don't know if you know this, given that they don't always include every part of the investigation and the report and stuff like this, but mm-hmm. did they ever get a vehicle? Was it his, it's his car? Oh, her car. Her car. Yeah. Ah. But it doesn't sound like the dad gave like a license plate or a description of the car and the call. I, they would have. I would assume campus police would have that information. But I did just. Say I was about to say five that. minutes ago not to assume. So I was like, Jess, what did we just say about assuming? <laughs> I didn't. I it wasn't. Me. You would think they would pull up the reports. This is what I would do as a dispatcher. I'm just saying I would pull up that's, the previous. That's how we need to approach this. Yes. What I would do. As a dispatcher, I would pull up the previous reports and I would pull it up. I would look through, see if there's any kind of information that I might be able to get that could be pertinent to this call, right? Maybe right. a description of the boyfriend. Maybe yeah. a vehicle. I was I was that type of dispatcher too that included vehicle descriptions license plates if we had it i put it in call notes just because you don't know if they're gonna need it so yes what i would have done (laughs) was had like looked up vehicle information looked up like roommates you know what i mean that like look past contacts to see if maybe she was joking around with a friend or whatever you know what i mean like any trying to get anything yeah yeah sometimes you have to play detective a little didn't we say once upon a time we're basically detectives yep anyway it isn't until 2209 that the information was sent out about the suspect so that's an hour and a half an hour and 45 minutes almost two hours yeah so now at midnight 01, an alert is sent that clearly identifies the shooting subject as Melvin Rowland, a.k.a. Sean. The woman that Rowland had gone on a date with calls in a tipped police to where Rowland might be located, and he is found by Salt Lake Police after a foot pursuit at Trinity AME Church where he had shot himself. He's determined to be deceased. At the time, they send out an alert saying that Rowland is no longer a threat. I want to tell you this, though, and I'm going to send you this call. It sounds like, from the things I've read, that campus security did not give the ATL out to surrounding jurisdiction because this call comes in. So the alert, I guess, I know our campus here. Yeah, it's just a campus alert. They do, like, alert. text messages. Yeah, okay. it's a text message So was the alert. date a student also? No. How'd she find out? So eventually, 
Matt McCluskey calls the news and ap- apparently gets put on the news. Or maybe the date lived on campus. It wasn't very clear. But somehow she okay. sees that there's an ATL, right? Then she's like, oh, my God, I just went on a date with this weirdo. Yeah. And she calls in. So here's this next call. Hi. Um, my name's Matt McCluskey. Uh, my daughter is Lauren McCluskey. And she went missing tonight. And we reported it to the University of Utah Police. She's a student there. Uh-huh. And I'm just make, I just want to make sure that you guys know about that. Um, so we wouldn't really need to, other than her being listed, um, she would be listed as a missing person on the national database if you made a missing persons report. But, okay. Um, otherwise, I mean, okay, there's not so, else, anything else. So this is, this is, no, no, okay. So this is more than that. She was abducted while we were talking to her on the telephone. Okay. So, so we heard her being assaulted, and we called the uh, University of Utah campus police. And I'm just calling you to let you know that this just happened like uh, an hour ago. And it's not just she went missing. Was it, was it they were in the view of Lancer? Um, could you please say that again? Was it that they were in that silver view of Lancer? Uh, I don't know anything about a silver Buick Lancer. Okay. Yeah, university let us know about it. We had our units. Okay. Um, we notified them as well. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Okay. Okay. So somehow along the way, they, they gave him information. But did you hear him? He's like, I don't know anything about a silver Buick Lancer. Buick. So maybe that was the collar he was picked up in. But also, he gives her name, and he didn't recognize the name right away. Like, maybe he was super busy, and I'm not judging him. Maybe he didn't take the call. Maybe he was working fire. You know, all these things, right? Yeah. It doesn't sound like they had gotten the information out, like, in a very timely manner. Well, I think that's another tip to listeners. If you ever have to call pertinent information so and matt the dad touches on it right like he first says you know my daughter went missing that can mean a lot of different things Definitely. right but then he circles back and says abducted again that's that that lights a fire mm-hmm. you would hope that it would light a fire go, under some asses we need to get people there that, now yeah because missing can be anything from ran away to late for dinner to went on a trip and you haven't heard from them yet. Missing is a lot of things. Abducted, your life is in danger, right? Yeah. So, and I, I'm glad that he got to that faster this time, but yeah. there was, there is some kind of open-ended things that I wish that we had information for as to what they had. Yeah. Because he was aware enough to be like, oh yeah, well, we know about this Buick campus called us. Yeah. I just wonder how long it took for campus to call and it didn't it wasn't clear in any of the notes that I read and what exactly they gave. Well, that's why I was going to ask like what car it was that she was found in, because do we have like at any point from the very first time she called to make the report at any point along that timeline? Did they get his vehicle information? You know what I mean? Like, well, he didn't have a car because he had to borrow her car while she was gone. So it sounds like he didn't have a car and that's why he was picked up by his date. So maybe the Buick belonged to the date. It's just not very clear. Like there's a lot of notes, but that's not very clear. How long? The shooting occurred at 8 and this goes out at midnight. And when does her tip come in? At 2020, so 8.20 p.m., Lauren's on the phone with her mom when Mm -hmm. she gets confronted by Roland. 2023, Mm -hmm. call comes in from Lauren's father. He tells dispatcher his daughter is in trouble. Then, 2155, that's when her body's discovered. 2209, they send out the information. 2346 is when they send up the message lifting a secure in place orders. So, it must have been between 2209 and 2346 when she calls. Which makes sense, because if they went on a date, maybe it lasted like two hours. I don't know. In the days after the shooting, there was a lot of review of how the police had handled Lauren's case because she had clearly done everything she could. Yeah. On October 23rd, University Police Chief Dale Brophy told reporters that his officers were unable to find Roland in the days before the shooting. However, there is no evidence that anyone had actually gone to look for him. 
His parole officer had even spoken to him on October 16th, and they had never been informed of his possible involvement in harassment. Oh, he was on parole. <laughs> That's huge, because you would want to talk to the parole officer and let the parole officer know that this guy is a uh, lead in this ongoing case. You would think. And you would think if they ran him, it would come back with a supervised release hit, and they would yep. notify them and say, hey, we ran this guy. This is why. Hey, everyone. It's Jess here. Um, so I'm butting into the middle of this recording to let you know that this episode turned into a little bit of a beast and it was longer than we expected. We didn't really plan for it, so I'm breaking it into two episodes, but I don't have a clean break. So that's why I'm here, to tell you to come back next week for the resolution of this case and, you know, we'll kind of talk more about Dispatch side of things as well. Okay, I'm gonna go now. Thanks. Bye! Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.